Okay, so perhaps we will get started now. Oh. So welcome to everybody in person and online to this Synapse seminar. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose land we're meeting here in Canberra and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And then I'd like to pass over to Ray to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Beth. Um, so I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Fred Salter, and I'm probably saying his surname wrong. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's my I'm Kiwi I'm ignorance. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Fred, I think, for about five or six years yeah. now. Um, so, and Fred's just prepared a short bio that I'm going to read out. Uh, so Fred is an ecologist specialised in global change ecology and biogeography. His research focuses on how environmental and biological drivers shape the spatio-temporal responses of terrestrial species vertebrate and vegetation to past, present and future climate changes. Um, so Fred and I are both investigators on the recently funded and Janelle over here, um, Center of Excellence for Indigenous and Environmental Histories and Futures. I can't do that. It's a mouth, it is a mouthful, but it's very exciting, co-design based um, uh, Center of Excellence, seven years funding to work on uh, questions around uh, landscape management with Indigenous communities in Australia. Um, and we've been talking a little bit about getting Fred up here to talk about his research because it's incredibly relevant to people in all sorts of fields who are interested in history. And I think today you're going to be talking about your work on the migrations into Sahul. Yes. And very excited to hear about that. Thank you. Take it away. All right. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, I also gonna to like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, pay my respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. So when when we start talking about me giving the seminar, uh, I've been told that the length of the seminar was about 50 minutes, one hour. And I thought, I can talk for an hour. That's that's no problem. And then I realized that maybe not everybody gonna to want to listen to me for an hour. And uh, that might be difficult, even if they're interested. Sometimes it's difficult to stay for an hour and focus on what someone is saying for an hour. So for all of those people who are gonna suffer in silence, I'm gonna give you the summary of the seminar straight away. So at least you know what the takeaway is. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is that the migration, human migration out of Africa, migration corridors are being shaped by forest, grass, grassland, temperature, precipitation change, and proximity to a river. The second one is the voyage, the entrance into Sahul from Sunda was not random and landscape, familiar and stable landscape was very important. The third one is when they get into Sahul, we have, we try to estimate the amount of people that arrived actually, and we estimated something like 1300 people that arrived, we talk about waves or at once, a little bit later, and migrated through Australia via what we call super highways. And then I'll touch a little bit on the regional consequences of human and climate change on megafauna uh, extirpation, which is regional uh, extinction across Australia. So that's it. You know everything. I'm happy to take any question. <laughs> and, uh, otherwise, I'm going to start unpacking that uh, little by little, a little bit differently than, I, than I'm used to do, because from the first, from the ecological lens, lens, lens and how I'm, I was interested in bridging different disciplines. And when I started, when I arrived in Adelaide in South Australia, uh, it was about in 2013. And I talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, my journey as early career researcher and ecologist through this work. So you, you, you will have a rough idea about what came to my mind and the kind of thought that I had to design those things along, along the way. Some of those thoughts were great, some of those not so much, but you, I'll, I'll let you know as well. So the idea of, uh, as an ecologist, I started to try to learn about Homo sapiens, the different species, and so on and so forth, that Homo sapiens was the only surviving representative of the hominin group. I started scanning through the literature and saw that there was some sort of, the expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa was related to some climate fluctuations, some climate drivers. So here, for example, I'll give you just some sort of a really loose chronology showing that uh, human expansion through from uh, Africa across the world uh, are mostly uh, as a function of glacial inter uh, interglacial cycle. And along the way, I came across 
this paper in particular that maybe uh, some of you know or some of you don't. Uh, and and I start thinking, so that's me reading, by the way. So I know it's really, uh, the, the resemblance is just striking. But I start looking at this, and on this map, what you see is pretty much timing of arrival based on archaeological evidences. So what the, the light yellow is the oldest time, and really dark is the, the youngest time of arrival based on archaeological, like I said. And all of those stars are archaeological data. And you can see all of those arrows. And when I read this, thing, because I wasn't uh, a trained archaeologist, the first thing I, I, I wonder was what happened here in those areas where we see all of those arrows. What, th there is no data. So wh what is happening? And I could come up with a bunch of justification to explain how interesting it is to study uh, um, our history through the archaeology, through the genetic and everything. But the reality is, and that's one of those not so great thoughts, is that I'm a little bit of a nerd. And it kept me awake at night, literally thinking about, but what is happening here? What is happening? And it was actually, I remember like if it was yesterday, 3 a.m. in the morning, I got up I looking at the ceiling and I said, I need to try to find something. And what are the limitations? What don't we know? What's going on in between? So the main reason for that is, in ideal world, we will have all of the data in the world. You know, that would be those archaeological evidence here. We would have them spread everywhere. That's not the case. And two things. The first thing is, the main arrival for human is all usually estimated by using the first age that we have on the site. It's not really representative of the first appearance. That's probably the first time that we can record it. Doesn't mean that they were not there before just as the first time that we see it. So in terms of appearance, that's a strong approximation. And the second thing is, there is no way that we can have a continuous map of those arrival, because the data are just too scattered in terms of geology. That would be great if we had it. The genetic has the same problem. I mean, our genetic data also have those kind of limitations. And so I thought, is there a way with my, my background being ecological modeling and statistics, that I can use those tools to try to get the best of both worlds, genetics and archaeology, and try to fill the gaps and see if we can come up with some maps so we can have some proper arrows that pretty much are informative. So for the, for the people who don't know much about stats and ecological modeling, so a little bit of a, 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 of a not crash course, but almost, there is something that we need to be on the same page when we talk about modeling and stats. That's nature, what we try to reproduce with our models, all right? And there are a lot of things happening on this, on this, on this picture. You have uh, prey, predator interaction, climate change happening, all of those kind of stuff. It's highly dimensional. And with the best technology that we can have, all of the computing power, everything in the world, the best way to reproduce these things is going to be something like this. So yeah, it does have implication on that. The main implication is models suck at predicting things because we make assumption and we simplify things. The cool stuff though, is they're really good at testing scenarios and against actual data. So the idea that's gonna be pretty much what's gonna happen along this talk is we're gonna to try to infer things, create scenarios through models and see, not trying to find the truth, but try to find which of the scenario that we build is most likely represented in the data that we have. Right, so it's kind of congruence uh, work. So the first problem that we had was, yeah, uh, uh, extinction or appearance are uh, rarely observed directly, like I said before. If you have here, that's a line, a timeline with the present day on the left, the past on the right, and all of those dots can be fossil or archaeological evidence that are dated, you know, and you have standard deviation around it because those are the same. Every, the only thing that we know is that for a species to get extinct, the species got extinct pretty much between the last age that we have and now. If we want to be very, very conservative, it's not being meaningful, but that's the reality of it. And the arrival, that's the other way around. It's before the first age that we had. They arrived at some point there. So then the idea was to try to develop some statistical analysis, and I'm not going to get into too much statistical model, but basically based on the distribution of those age, we try to find the probability over time that's the 
species get actually extinct. So you can do that for extinction, and you can do that for the first arrival. So that gives you a little bit of a better estimate with confidence interval of the, the, the timing of extinction or the timing of arrival, depending on which way you want to look at it. There is a ton of literature about it. I'm not going to go through that uh, too much, but that's one way to deal with what we call a signal effect, which is pretty much we can't detect the first, the very first time the human arrived or detect the, the last time we see the species. Usually those approaches are applied as uh, in you know, big continental scale or when you have a lot of data because you need to have a certain amount of data in stats to have something powerful. Rarely, especially explicitly. With this type of approach, you still can't have some sort of map of arrival uh, timing or extinction timing. So the challenge was then, when we have dates like this, which are uh, radiocarbon dates for uh, archaeological evidence for human, how can we generate, using those approach, something that's going to be specially meaningful? So what we do here is pretty much, first we grid the space. We need to have some sort of georeference. So we grid the space. The resolution doesn't really matter. In general, the standard approach is about one degree, 110 kilometers by 110 kilometers, or 50, 50 kilometers. It depends. Things are pretty good when you find yourself in a grid cell where you have a ton of data. That's no question. You can't apply the kind of method that I, that I, that I uh, described just before. What's getting, what seems getting a little bit trickier is when you have nothing, where we have those arrows with those big question marks. Then we need to try to be a little bit clever and find a way to integrate those data and have those, uh, those timing. So just for the concept of it, imagine that you have, here's a grid cell, and all of those dots are your age. You can represent those age, so they're spatially represented. You can basically represent that as a timeline as well. So this one, you have the same symbol a little bit of everywhere. And what you want to do is for this grid cell, estimate the timing of extinction, uh, of arrival. But instead of using just what's in the grid cell, we're going to use the entire data set that we have. Everything, including everything in North America or in Africa or whatever, if we want to look at something in Australia. The difference is the contribution of each of those dates is going to be different for the final outcome based on their distance to the grid cell. In other words, the closer you're going to be from this grid cell, the more impact your age and your, your sample is going to be going to have on the final outcome. The farther away, the less impact it's going to have, but it's still going to have an impact. So in a way, it's some sort of an interpolation, extrapolation exercise, but you weight the contribution of those age to have a map and to create a map in those empty grid cells. And so that gives you some map like this, like you see on the top left and top right. Top left is the type of map that we have based on archaeology only. So that's the timing of arrival based on archaeology using the approach that I just described, just based on radiocarbon dates. That's why I've been very careful to avoid all of the South Asia and even Australia because radiocarbon dates are limited there. Then on the side, I saw, yeah, well, there's a lot of things done in genetic. Why don't we try to see what genetic can bring on top of the archaeology? And so what I represented here is basically the mitochondrial DNA and the, pretty much the FST, the, the genetic distance between uh, location. And then once you have those two maps, so they're represented, you try to find the pathways across those maps. The idea here is to try to find for archaeology, for example, you have at the bottom here, you have a map with two dot points. That's the starting point and the end point. And you're trying to, to find the pathways that you try to, in a way, minimize what we call the cost. In other words, when you start, let's say that here, so I don't see if people are probably not going to see that on that, but I'm at the left uh, red dot on the map. If you had 60,000 years, you're not going to go to the next grid cell if the next grid cell is 40,000 years, while another one's going to be at 59,000 years. You're going to preferentially go to the 59 ones and then later to the 40. So you try to keep a continuum to minimize the difference in age between grid cells as you go. And that's going to be the same thing for genetic. For example, you're going to try to go through grid cells that have the smallest distance, genetic distance across, across the map. So that's an equation just to show that I'm not just displaying pretty figure. There is also some mathematical background behind that. The delta in red that I show here can be anything in this approach. It can be difference between age, archaeological age, difference between genetic distance, difference in, difference in terms of climate, 
difference in terms of language, if you have a way to measure whatever you want, that's going to have a delta a difference, you can put that in there. That's going to be exactly the same thing. And then what the algorithm does, it tries to look for the distance that minimize those costs and those distance along the way. With a little bit of a catch, is there is a lot of literature showing least cost path. Uh, that's in a, jar in a jargon, that's what we call a least cost path approach. The only issue with least cost path is the human behavior. We're very good at doing things for no reason. Not because there is a least cost path. And we can't explain it. You just sometimes go somewhere for the sake of exploring. And sometimes it matters. So we integrate in this algorithm some sort of random behavior. Sometimes that's not going to be the shortest path. Sometimes it's not going to be the best outcome, but you do it anyway, and sometimes you have some wins. So that's a little bit of a difference in the approach. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, only Natalie lost money product. It was my fault. <laughs> so we did that for the archaeology. We did that for the genetic. And then you have a bunch of trajectories. And here on the, le on the right side, I plotted the cost of genetic versus against the, the, the cost of archaeology against the cost of genetic. And we look for congruence. When do we have archaeology and genetic that gives you exactly the same answer? So that, those are those blue and, uh, and orange uh, trajectories. And so among all of the trajectories, so I just show a few trajectories that I try in, in green, just for this place, but there are many more. So in that example in particular, that would be those two, the blue and the, and the orange distances that we would select. And we did that for the entire world. So we tried to cover the bunch of different trajectories, everything that was possible, north, south, east, west, every single continent. And we came out pretty much with those trajectories in green that are the most likely, the one that shows congruence between what the genetic tells you and what the archaeology tells you simultaneously. With some dates and some deviation gave, that, gave, uh, that, that are given to you by uh, uh, archaeology. Once you have that, those are very inference based. I was interested in, okay, but what can explain that? I mean, I have some most likely trajectory, least likely trajectories. What are the difference between those two? What happened? Why are you going to choose one instead of the other? Beyond just the least cost path, random behavior, and statistical approach. Ecologically speaking, are they that different? So, what we did, we just tested different environmental variables. Change in temperature, change in precipitation that are usually simulated by models, past the climate models, distance to the nearest river, uh, distance to the nearest coast, the landscape, forest, non forest, uh, across space, the ruggedness. You know, is the landscape difficult to access or is it really easy to go? And the idea was, so the data looks much more like this in reality. And the idea was, okay, let's have a look at what the data are on those most likely trajectories. Well, let's have a look at what the data are on those least likely trajectories and let's compare. Is there something coming up? And I spare you with uh, the whole stats, magic, randomization stuff no one cares about. The final outcome is, that pretty much when you look at the probability that there is actually a signal driven by the nearest coast. So if you look at this histogram, so here at the bar plot, temperature, precipitation, you have distance to coast that is very, very small. Everything else is supposed to keep going and I'm going to get there. So distance to coast, yeah, not much uh, happening between least likely and uh, most likely route. Not much explaining there across the entire globe. When you look a little bit more, you have a better probability for the ruggedness, but still, I mean, 0 0.5 is pretty much 50-50. That doesn't mean much. And then you have pretty much temperature, uh, vegetation, so the landscape composition, uh, um, a little bit of precipitation happening, and the distance to the river. So, so far, I'm just being very general there. And I thought, okay, that's, that, that's pretty good for, for, for first part, but regionally speaking, what's happening? Do we have the same hierarchy, the same rank everywhere, meaning temperature first, vegetation first, and so on and so forth everywhere, or do we have some shift depending on where you are? And that's what this map is uh, showing you. Don't try to absorb that. We could talk about this map for about five hours, and I know you don't want that. So the take-home message being, so those color codes shows you areas where 
So let's say in blue, for example. In blue, for example, is the area where when humans arrive, temperature were cooler than when they left Africa at this spot. There were more precipitation and the ecosystem was forest. That's the blue. The red is going to be still low temperature compared to when they left Africa at this point. High precipitation, but this time it's grassland instead. So that gives you kind of the composition and the environmental dynamic of the ecosystem. I'm going to break that down a little bit, making things a little bit simpler for you and for my own sake as well, to be honest, because that's a bit overwhelming. If we just look at temperature, that's the difference in, in temperature between least likely and most likely use. What you see here in those nice plots, because yeah, I try to make them nice. They're not that pretty usually when they come out, come out. But pretty much everything is at the right side of the zero, which means that the most likely routes tend to have warmer temperature, warmer ecosystem. It's still bloody cold. We're still in a time period where things are cold compared to when they left, compared to 90,000 years ago. It's still cold, but that's the least, cost, least cold pathways, in other words. So slightly warmer. And so you can see here, so that's what this map represents. So if you're really in the red, which is not so much, that means that you have higher temperature. If you're really in the blue, that means that you're really, really cold compared to when they left Africa. So you try to be pretty much in the light blue as much as you can. Borderline dark, but usually all of these trajectories tend to be in the light blue. There are some locations that you can't do otherwise, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But usually preferentially, that's the least cold areas. Same deal with precipitation. Precipitation that tells you again you're, about, you're, you're on the side of the zero, on the positive side of it, meaning that they look for wettest area, more humid. And when you look at the map, same thing if you're in the dark green, that's more humid. If you're very light green, yellowish, that's more dry. So you see in most of the area, mostly in when you go to Western Europe or in the Amazon, for example, you're really in the dark, uh, in, in, in dark green. Still, again, in Siberia and everything, that's a little bit harder to, to go through. It's not that wet over there. It was not that wet over there at the time. And that's where come into play the distance to river. We, we realize that when you have those climate very challenging, that they are not the preferential climate for humans, they stay really, really close to the river, to the main river. The other thing is when you look at the distribution of the vegetation. Forest, non-forest. If you look at the distribution of the forest biome, you're pretty much in between the negative side of it, meaning that you, they tend to be less foresty, but not too much. And when you spread that spatially explicitly, you realize that all of those trajectories, they're really close to grassland, but also they're, they're within grassland, but also very close to forest. That's ecologically speaking, the, the area that we, told, we call ecotone, which is a massive thing in general, so that's you're, you're in between, pretty much. Those areas tend to be high hotspots of biodiversity. You can find shelter in the forest, and you can just travel through grassland pretty, pretty easily. I'm speculating, I'm interpreting. All I'm seeing on, that, on, this, on those results is it's grassland, but not too much. That's pretty much where we're at. So hence the first, uh, the first point of my presentation, in my summary, that we have forest ecotone uh, ecosystem, Temperature, precipitation, and distance to the river, that play a role, not everywhere the same, depending on where you are. Now, the next question is, all up to now, I just presented what happened in everywhere else but here. Now, what happened when we arrive in here, to arrive here? So the first thing is, how do we go from Sunda land to Sahu? There's a lot of literature, there are a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of work done. At the end of the day, you need to cross. One way or another, you're going to have to cross. And so you have two pretty much main routes in the literature that you can see the northern route that goes up there, up north, and the southern route that goes down south. As you guess, I had, again, coming from Europe, I knew very little about those things. So I started to get educated and knowing about those routes and everything. And in my mind, I'm not a sailor. So in my mind, and Disney recently just pictured that that's very funny and very fun and great, you know? And I thought, oh, well, no, no big deal. Actually, you can, see, uh, you, you, can, you can see the land, so you know where to go. Go for it. 
Chances are that it can happen sometimes, but usually that's more looking like this. You know? And that's become tricky to start, where do you navigate? How do you do things? So we could try again with, with some models to try to have a little bit of a feel of what scenarios could be likely to get you from Sunda to Savo, depending on different type of condition. So the idea is here, you have Sunda here, you have some islands here and you want to get there. We did some sort of drift modeling, trying to go from very first principle. So all of this model, like I said, they're very simplified. So you try all the time to have some rules, but very, uh, a minimum amount of rules, three, four, and see what, and see what emerges. You can go bonkers with, with rules and optimize as much as you want. At some point, you're going to be extra specific, but you, you can't say anything at the end of the day. Well, if you go very general, you have some rules and see what what's going to emerge from the pattern that you see. It's not going to be perfect. There's a lot of confidence interval, but at least you you stay really close to the data you have. So the first thing is, can I see where I'm going? That's the first thing that we try to take into account. So you should. The second thing is, well, what's the current over there? You know, can we go against the current or not? The third is going to be what's going to be the wind. You know, I doubt that there was any engine back in the day, so wind might play, might play a little bit of a role. And so then we did, we designed those kind of drift modeling, and the idea was to simulate some create some boats, and send boats around across those, taking into account all of those factors, and see how long they were going to take to go from one land to the next. The thing that we added then is when you reach a land. Can you survive there? You know, because it makes no sense to reach a land if it's just completely barren and you're gonna die five days later because there is no food, there is no way to survive. So we, on top of that, for each of those islands, we build some sort of demographic model that I'm gonna get uh, into really um, in a simple way like this, which that too is just to show people that there are actually some stuff behind all of those maps. Human demography, modeling 101, let's make it simple. You basically take a model that are several age class. So in that case, we have five age class. You have baby, brat, sorry, teenager, uh, young adult, uh, not so young adults, and old person. All of those people, you go from one class to the next if you're able to survive, obviously. And then you also, depending on your age, you can reproduce, which is the fertility uh, aspect. So fertility aspect, we took some hunter gatherers data to have pretty much how fertile you are, likelihood to reproduce depending on your age. Uh, survival, well, you have the survival based on your age as well, which is not looking so good as your age in general, like that's the way it is. And you can also have some catastrophic events, something happening, you know, that's taken into account. You have the probability that you're gonna go, you're gonna move, you can just disperse as well. Those those models they just consider an island as an object, so there is no space in there. An island is an island; they, they don't start crawling through the island. And then there is the carrying capacity. What we call the carrying capacity is going to be the abilities, the ability of your ecosystem to support you. There's going to be a point where there's going to be too many people, and we know that all too well now. And we don't have enough Earth and planets to to survive. If it's the case, you start seeing the population just dropping or capping and start dropping. If you don't have, if you have heaps of resources, the population keeps growing. That's pretty much the, the idea, the simplified way. And so we have that. We have all of those little boats going from A to B. Every time that they arrive in B, you check if they can survive. And if they can survive and the population can grow, they go from B to C. And keep on going. And we measure through all of those routes here the chance and how long it's going to take to go from across all of the ocean. And so basically, if you go through the first, the northern route, you have pretty much here that what it means, all of those small numbers, don't freak out too much, is just meaning from Sunda to Sulawesi, basically, that tells you that you have 99.6% chance to make the trip in three days. That's what it means. Then you have, and then you keep on going. So you see, I mean, the probability here are pretty high in the northern route. It's accessibility, and, uh, and that works pretty well. In the south, though, you have the same type of probability, a little bit lower. It's not as easy to navigate. So you have 78.2 in six days. Six days of in water might be a little bit daunting. Uh, so as you see here, there is a little bit of a pattern. Now, is this pattern in the north or in the south could happen completely randomly? 
Is it just sheer luck? You know. So we tested that, and actually you have about 13% chance that seeing this pattern in the north could happen completely randomly. So there is something behind it. What it is, I wouldn't be able to explain, but it's there is something driving this pattern. It's not just something completely by chance. And when you look at the south, it's about yeah, five, five percent chance for this pattern to be random, which is pretty small at all. Now the idea was to look at, okay, but when you arrive on shore, how many people should be arriving? You know? So that's what we call probability, the, the minimum founding population. You try to look at how what's the minimum population that you need to survive on the landscape. And so that's the what you see here on this graph is the test if you come with 200 people. 400, 600, up to 2,000, and you have the probability of quasi-extinction. Probability of quasi-extinction is pretty much the probability of um, functional extinction, meaning that you're so low in terms of number of people that genetically speaking, you have a high uh, rate of inbreeding, and so your population is not going to survive for much longer. So that's pretty much what it gives you. And the result tells you that, yeah, okay, about 1,300, 1,100, 600 individuals are necessary to maintain a population. Now, the second question is, do you need to have all of those people arriving just at once? I don't know what kind of boat could do that back in the day, but you know. Or can you go with weight? And so that's what we tested as well. And pretty much we send the same thing, people by wave of tenths of people and see if you send them in a regular way, so 10 people every, so that's the x-axis, every 50 years, every 100 years, every 150, up to every 300 years, what's the probability of quasi-extension? What you want in the end is to stay below or really close to this blue horizontal line. As long as you're close to that, you're fine. And what it tells you is, well, depending on if you send people regularly, the same amount of people, or just pretty unlikely that you have such a you know, design, or completely randomly, People decide to go, okay, today's going to be a group of 10, tomorrow's going to be a group of 20, tomorrow's going to be three. In that case, you, that's the random, the green line. So roughly, it's every 70, 90 years, you can send people. If you want to go some wave of migration, that would be the ideal rate, right? Still with all of this limitation and everything, right? So that's the really inferring and testing scenario part of it. Then again, like, like I showed you for the rest of the world, I was interested in the ecological part, what the landscape was at the time when they arrived, you know? And I thought that would be cool to have an idea of what the landscape is. And I'm sure everybody around here is saying, yeah, that would be cool, but we haven't done it for a reason, you know? And I, I'm not making any difference in that case. Is the one of the best way to, to do that, and it's not because Janet is in the room, is for them, you know, right, to know what kind of landscape you have. The issue is you have a good temporal coverage up to the LGM, 20,000 years ago, more or less, and the data are relatively especially heterogeneous, always the same issue with missing data. How can we get the landscape, a proper landscape, continuous landscape, 60, 70,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago? That's tricky. And again, we, say, we, we thought, okay, what model could help you to, you know, to explore? Even if we don't have the truth, we can still explore scenarios. And so that was the idea when we start using vegetation model. So vegetation models in a nutshell, I'm not gonna give a class about what vegetation model is. Those are process based, so they simulate carbon cycle, water cycle, you have a climate, and they tell you the, 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 the type of plant functional type that you have, tropical species, temperate species, grassland, C3, C4, all those kind of things. And so you can map that. They're not always very accurate, but I'm not in that case gonna rely on the accuracy and how well you represent the vegetation here. What I am interested in here is mostly is biomass that they represent. Whatever the species, the plant species is, they represent some sort of biomass. And I'm interested in the relative change in biomass, not necessarily if you go from temperate for, from temperate to grassland. How the how the and, and the similarity, relatively speaking, especially explicitly. What I mean is. You have an ecosystem here in Australia, all right? You have all of the orange things here. You have the same thing in Sunda. You look at what's happening, he what's happening here, what's the type of biomass, what's the type of plant functional type? And the idea was, 
was it that different from the landscape that they, try, that they came across before? And, I, and we decided to say, let's have a look at the dissimilarity between what they're going and when they and where they came from. The idea being, if the ecosystem is not really that dissimilar, maybe they just went through the land, landscape that they already knew. You know, no, you don't have as much of adaptation to go in that case. It's familiar. Whereas if you used to come from out of Africa and you straight away you used to grassland, for example, and you go into a forest or something that you've never seen before, the, the, the adaptive rate is going to be much harder. But if you keep going through grassland, all right, that's that I can deal with. That was the, 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 the sense of it. So we basically tried to quantify the dissimilarity. So that's an in the index of dissimilarity. So the, the more you're in the blue or dark blue, the more dissimilar you are, the more different you are. The more you're in the light, uh, yellowish, the more similar you are. And if you look at this, you look at, yeah, well, I mean, the north looks pretty dissimilar. The south look quite similar. So that might be, yes, in terms of navigation, you know, it's easier to go through, but in terms of familiarity, that might explain why those southern routes were appealing to them, because that's the type of ecosystem that they already knew. The second thing is how much those ecosystems change over time, relatively speaking. The frequency, I might always go forest, forest, forest for 20,000 years, or am I going every second day forest grassland? I mean, that's obviously caricature here. You know, if you have a lot of ups and downs, it gets really tricky to adapt. If you have something that's relatively stable, then you can make plans. And that's what this shows you as well. So that's a stability index. The higher you are, so the more green you are, the more stable you are. And the light green shows the least stable, so unstable. And same, same deal here. You have the most unstable bits are in the north, and the most stable are in the south. So I'm not saying that they always go in south, but yes, northern routes really appealing in terms of navigation, and it's been shown in studies, they took this one. But that could very, very much be a justification of why they took the south one. It's probably because they knew the ecosystem that they were going to travel to, to go through, and it was relatively stable, so easy to adapt. So we did the bits where we go from Indonesia to, to Sahul. And then what? You land into Sahul, where are you going there? What are you going to do? And so that way you start thinking, okay, what's are going to be the, the main direction that I'm going to take? So here too, we started to develop what we call the superhighways. That's really catchy, uh, not my idea. I would love to take the credit for that, but not my idea. And the idea was the same. Let's take four principles, something very basic, four principles for spread and migration, and let's see if we can have some sort of pattern emerging. The first principle is gonna be the same thing as for the drift modeling stuff. Can we see where we're going? Is there some, something that sparks our attention? Uh, a mountain somewhere. I arrive in the land and say, oh, there is forest, mountain, maybe there's some water. I go there to explore. You know, any, any reason. So that's a shed. The second thing is, can, do I have the physical capacity to go there? Because we're still human, you know. And if I see something like, oh, that sounds like a great mountain, 200 kilometers under the sun, you know, in a arid zone of Australia, maybe I'm not going to cover that during the day. So those energy, uh, energy expenditure needs to be taken into account. The other one is going to be the ruggedness. Is it easy to access or is it going to be just really, really hard? That is going to influence my decisions. I mean, there are very few people that doesn't stop them. It would stop me. And then the access to water. Do we have water nearby? And we saw in the uh, uh, earlier in this talk that actually water was essential in some areas, mostly when you have really harsh climates. And I mean, we, we agree that Australia can be harsh in terms of climate. So we did those four main principles and tested a little bit the same way as we did before, all the possible trajectories and pathways that we could go across Australia. We use a model called, called FET, which is actually an acronym from everywhere to everywhere, meaning that we took at 10 meters resolution every single point across Australia and calculated the probability to go from one A to B uh, for everywhere. We're talking about 125 billions of possible pathways so we, we hijacked uh, the system of the US government, actually, to run this thing. 
that didn't like it. I mean, we had also already, obviously, it's recorded, so I'm not going to say otherwise. But we, we, the bottom line was we had to use a massive amount of resource, and we tested all of those possible pathways across Australia. The color code here show you where they intersect. So the most likely route is the, uh, when you're in the red, for example, that means that all of those pathways join at this point in particular. So you have preferential, preferential routes and non-preferential routes, but in a much more detailed way than what I presented across Europe uh, and, and the world before. So as you can see here, and something that's interesting to notice is the, 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 red, the, the black dot are the archaeological evidence for human spread. We didn't use those data to, to, to build the model. We use them, we plot them on top of that just to check if it wasn't too silly what we were doing. So again, scenario testing. We have a scenario of those super highways. In some areas, we're fine. In some other areas, we're just not. But there are some cool components here that, that, that you can see happening. And when you look at the trade route now, actually, some of them are still, are, are still live. You have some of those major uh, trade routes here. And yeah, you have some sort of movement uh, across the what's now submerged. Here it's just about inference. If we want to know a little bit more about the ecological process, the cool thing to do would be how about we try to add some demography on top of this now? Because so far we haven't talked about demography. We haven't talked about, like I said before, with both small islands. If the landscape is suitable, we can reproduce, we can survive, we can age. So here we thought, well, let's couple those and try to build a model that take into account those superhighways, still the nice equation just in case to even know that it's not just ready. And the demographic modeling that we use. So it looks like something, so same deal, you have five age class, you get exactly the same principle, and you have those superhighways. So that looks like a little bit like this. So it's just layers. You have layers of, that's a grid, that's the space. I mean, this just bad drawing and not, and yeah, that's, that's why, I, you know, I'm not, an artist. Um, pretty much what it tells is you go from one grid cell, one, one spot, you want to go to the next, you have to take into account the landscape, you have to take into account the water, you have to take into account basically everything that's underlying the superhighway. And those superhighways are going to be preferential to migrate. And so pretty much that gives you something like this. So let me take a little bit of time just for, for show. The color code is pretty much when you're dark, that means that you saturate the grid cell uh, to the maximum. So the, we were talking about carrying capacity. That means that you reach, when you're dark, you reach the carrying capacity. The landscape cannot support your, the population anymore. The population has to move somewhere else. And when you're in the, the light, that means, okay, you have uh, still a little bit of room. So then you have variation of climate and everything. You see this variation in the great desert, for example. They still going through, but they're not super keen, you know. And so, in other words, what you see here, you have we have two entry points. We have we've tested a bunch of entry points, north only, south only, different time of entry from seventy thousand plus to forty thousand, and test all of these different scenarios possible and try to validate that against actual evidence, so archaeological data, for example. And when we have the best we had so far. Not perfect, but the best thing that we had was an entry point north and south that happening here. You have New Guinea most, mostly uh, populated through the north, but relatively delayed. It took a little bit of time. So those time here that you see are the number of here relative to the entrance. That's not 60,000 years ago. It's when you are 60,000 here, that means that human arrived 60,000 years from the, that, that point. So it spent, they spent 60,000 years traveling, all right? So it's not middle also. So if you look at that, you have relatively a long time to spread across New Guinea. When you look at the south here, the other side, the south shoes, it's much more quicker, mostly because of the superhighway. Because you go through here, those areas that were the superhighway, so you, you, and you reach the bottom pretty quick. And by the time that you reach the south, you can actually cross to Tasmania, which depending on which model you use, is flooded or not. Bass Strait can be flooded or not. And if you have just one entry in the north, 
there is no scenario whatsoever that can give you the connection to Tasmania. Every time that they arrive down there, it's flooded and they don't have access. The only way to do that is using those super highways and having two entry points. Maybe in a few years' time, we're going to find something else, but at this stage, from what we tested, that's what we have. So just a little bit of a recap. If, you, uh, if it was too long and too boring, at least you get the, the, the gist. North-South, you want to have a landscape um, very navigable and uh, easy to travel to, to, to go through in the north, but uh, it was more unstable and, uh, and newer. Time of number of people that should arrive, yeah, uh, 1,300 uh, 1300 in one, one migration wave could happen, most likely several wave. And then I was pretty remarkable to see that the, the diversity of region that they, that they came across. When you see all of those different landscapes, still they managed to go through Australia in a pretty short amount of time in geological time, right? So that's the, the pitch for the human spread. Then when, once they were there, obviously they were driven by the landscape, what's the ecosystem happening, but they also have a feedback effect. What was the impact of their presence on the ecosystem? And again, like I said, I'm a foreigner. My accent probably gave it away, I'm from France. Uh, when the first time I got a job to go to Australia, my first thought was this. <laughs> Completely naive, I was just, Jesus, shark, spider, snakes, get me out of here. I was really, I was freaking out. Then I realized that actually not every single species tried to kill you. So I learned to like the place. But the thing is, that's the, the, the fauna and the uh, innovation that we know now. Back in the day, they looked more like this, right? So big beasts, most of them herbivore, not all of them. But so I have the feeling that when you come from Europe, Northern Hemisphere or whatever, and you land in Australia and you see marsupial like this, first, okay, marsupial, that's the first shock to the system. <laughs> and then you just say, wow, that's gonna be, you know, something will happen. Not necessarily bad, but it's a shock to the system. Those type of megafauna and big herbivore, they're really useful for, they were really useful for the ecosystem and big, Big herbivore and big animals in general are really useful. They really good seed dispersal agent when they go from A to B. It's great for the landscape. They recycle root nutrient pretty well as well. They browse or grazer, so they maintain patchy habitats, which is what we want in terms of biodiversity most of the time. And they that's reduced fire frequency in general. I'm not a fire expert, but I still know that that having them around is pretty good for the ecosystem. You know, the problem is across the world, about 70%, 70% of all of the mammals just get wiped out 40, 50, 60,000 years ago. Then came the problem, the final problem, and I'm not going to get too much into it, but just gloss over it. It was whether or not humans were involved in this extinction. Right. Two school of thought, that was just climate change. Second school of thought, that was only human. Usually, I mean, from my experience in ecology, it's never that black and white. Talk about this a little bit later. There is a massive consensus. I mean, over the years, when you look at the literature, actually, there is, there is kind of a consensus everywhere across the world, but in Australia. <laughs> that was the, 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 the tricky part. And it's nobody's fault. It's just because it's really hard to get the data to support anything uh, you know, in Australia because of preservation. And that, so that, 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 that's, it's difficult to have like I mentioned here, an accurate chronology, and I'm gonna to come to this now, is because most of these consensus come from chronological analysis. So what they do, we come back to what I presented at the beginning in this talk, you have timelines and you have fossil and you have archeological evidence, they date it, and you try to, to, to reconstruct a timeline when things happen and how. So here's just a timeline, present day is on the, on the left, past is on the, is on the right, it's, I do math and stuff, so that's usually how it's displayed. I know a lot of people don't like that. It's my twisted way to present stuff, so please bear with me. Uh, and you have, underneath that, you have data. In blue, that's gonna be megafauna data, fossil data, for dichrosodon, for example. Age plus standard deviation. In orange, that's gonna be human, artifact. Age plus standard deviation. Then you have a proxy, usually uh, I score, reconstruction in that case, just for the sake of the example, uh, that move 
all the time. So that's expressed in terms of anomaly. If people are not uh, uh, familiar with anomaly, that's pretty much temperature relative to present day. So minus four means it was four degrees colder than now. Then what you do, you estimate the extraction date, usually with the last or with those fancy statistics that I introduced to you this uh, earlier on. And you say, okay, megafauna went extinct now, at this stage. Human arrived at that date. Ooh, we have a window of coexistence. Anything can happen. <laughs> That's pretty much a rationale, right? And then you say, okay, we can't rule out the, the human aspect. There was interaction at some point. They were, occupy, they were occupying the landscape at the same time. Hunting, no hunting, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they were there. Opportunities there. What happened in terms of climate? Do we have some sort of massive climate change happening at the same time? So I could say that's because of climate change. In that case, not really. So usually the, the, the argument is, well, climate change didn't happen. Human were there, so human did it. Uh, again, big shortcut here, but that's pretty much what comes out in this, in this kind of school of thought. Second possibility, you have this type of thing. You have a later, uh, a bigger windows of coexistence. Now people start thinking, well, that's a bit long to be naive to the prey, and maybe the prey they start to get it, you know, that humans are not that great and should probably, you know, live pretty quick. And then you look at the climate change and you see, oh, there is a climate change here. Temperature change drastically, uh, most likely climate change. All right, that's scenario number two. Scenario number three, you have something like this, and then so there's a no-brainer. Uh, extinction arrived before human, happened before human, so that, could, that couldn't happen. You rule out human, and you say, okay, climate change was uh, probably the culprit. So we tried to do this kind of exercise, but the problem was, again, the data. The data we didn't have a lot of data, so it was really difficult to do some, any sort of spatial analysis with the data that we had. So first thing we did, we looked at the continental scale. That's the different type of data we have for humans. So everything that's orange and red are human. Everything that's blue is megafauna, pretty much. The dark color means that's the that's dates that you can rely on for statistical purpose. I'm not saying that they awful for anything else, but it's just you need some sort of reliability in your data set to use them in terms of contamination, all this kind of thing. So I'm not going to get too much into the detail, but pretty much everything is dark is the only thing that we could use. And so we built this chronology. And so this chronology, so show you, depending on different type of taxa here, we have a timeline, zero is again on the left, uh, the past is on the right, uh, in 1,000 years, and you offer each taxa, so you look for the windows of uh, extension, the darker, the more certain you are about the window, all right? So when you go to the light, blue, for example, that means that, yeah, that's a window, but with very low confidence. So pretty much you want to just look at the dark blue to be pretty sure of the window. I, just, I didn't want to hide that from you guys, so I show you the entire result. And when you merge that and you look at with human, so we had something human arriving around, yeah, at the time. So I'm talking about 2016 at the time that was, that was the case. You have human arriving and then you have some sort of cascade in terms of extinction. Again, don't mean that there is causation, there is just something happening. When you look at the windows of coexistence, so you put everything together, you look at the average uh, extension timing, and you reconstruct pretty much a windows of coexistence between this average extension time and average arrival time of 13.5 thousand uh, years old. So that's a pretty long windows of coexistence where anything could happen within the, 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 in the scenario number one. And then you look at different proxy of, uh, of climate change. So you have temperature anomaly from the, from the Antarctic. You have some temperature anomaly and precipitation anomaly from climate models as well, just because they're more regional. So they give you a better idea of what you have in different spots instead of having something, a proxy 3,000 kilometers away from here. And you have different, uh, I'm not gonna get too much into the, the other things, the Enso power, which is give you a, an index of, uh, of dryness, I would say. And the temperature velocity, temperature velocity is a funny one. Pretty much it tells you how fast species should move to track the climate change. So that's the speed of the climate change. So in other words here, when you look at uh, those peaks 20,000 years ago down there, uh, that means that the, the species should go to 120, 150 meters per year to track the climate change of that peak. Right. 
So the orange here show you the windows of extinction that I was talking about for all of the big mass models. And when you look in terms of climate change, I mean, there were some climate change events happening before that, and still the, the species were still there. So why would you have climate change event here happening? And that would be a dramatic problem, while before it didn't happen. I'm not ruling out the, 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 the scenario. I'm just saying that raised some question marks. And when you look at the climate velocity, for the climate speed to have an effect, the species should have tracked about, yeah, 150, 170 meters per year. I mean, we're talking about, you know, rhino size, hippo size. I have the feeling that they can move 150 meters per year. So anyway, not so, not so great for the climate so far. So what I did, I just tested also a correlation between the proportion of extinct species and the climate change. So for each of those index. So pretty much I did two different models. The first one assuming a linear relationship between those, and the second one assuming no relationship at all and compare those two scenarios. Just scenario comparison. We're not trying to find the truth. We're trying to see which one is the most likely. And I'm gonna gloss over the, the statistical magic behind the pretty much the higher value you have, the more support you have for a cor linear correlation, the lower value you have in the evidence ratio, the least support you have for a correlation. So in that case, that gives you the support for correlation for each of those proxy. So temperature anomaly, precipitation anomaly, uh, Antarctica or regional, and so power. And you about 0 0.91, so pretty much nothing. There is pretty much no support for a model showing any sort of correlation between the number of species extinct and the climate change. And that being said, we're talking about regional uh, at the continental scale. It doesn't mean that regionally speaking, and we saw that earlier with the human migration, some things wouldn't happen. And so I'm just showing you quickly a little bit of a recap. So that's where we're at. The last bit, and I won't be too, too, too long, is going to be, let's explore now with the technique that I showed you before, making those maps based on archaeological evidence. We can try to reconstruct for, from the southeast at least of Australia, the map of extinction timing and the map of human arrival. So on the left inside, you have the timing of extinction for megafauna. On the right inside, you have the arrival for human based on archaeological uh, date. And we try to do some sort of chronological analysis. So grid cell by grid cell, seeing for each of those grid cells, is there some, which scenario we're in? Megafauna went out first before human arrived. Do we have a windows of coexistence or not? That was pretty much what we tried to do. That's the size of the windows of coexistence um, that I show you here. In a nutshell, that show you the greener you are, the more coexistence between megafauna and human you have. The red -er, you have, I don't know if you say that in English, but the more red you are, you are it means that, for example, if you're really dark red, that means that megafauna were extinct 15,000 years before human arrived. Again, big, you know, uh, with uncertainties. So because we're human and I like having things black or white, you can bin that based on uncertainties and everything where you don't have any overlap. And so it, look, it looks like in this area, you've got about 70% of the study area that shows the human megafauna coexistence where you have an overlap. What, no matter what, what it, which one it is, there is an overlap. And you have all down south, no overlap at all. And then we did exactly the same thing with environmental variable. You, you look at those area and you try to think what characterize those areas. So in that case, you have your megafauna, the timing of uh, megafauna extinction, and you test for the effect of temperature, precipitation, water available, uh, drinkable water available, uh, desert fraction, is it really a desert or not, forest, non-forest, still this kind of biomass, and human arrival. And you try to pretty much build different model and see which model is gonna explain best the pattern that you see. So we're gonna have, so that's the data that we use, but you're gonna have then a model, for example, model number one is gonna be temperature only. I test just that temperature could explain the, the pattern, the variation in timing of extinction. How likely is that? I have a score of likelihood. Then I'm gonna build a second model. That's gonna be, let's say, temperature and uh, desert fraction. And I test this likelihood. Is it better or worse? That's what you test. And you do all of the combination that you can find, including human. So we start with just the part where humans were not involved. 
What you have here is just pretty much telling you that in all of those, the best model that we had was pretty much including so precipitation, water, and desert fraction. And then if you want to have the relative importance of all of those factors, you want to know, yeah, okay, I mean, none of those three factors, okay, but can I rank them as some more important than others? So you pretty much remove each one by one, and you see the contribution of each of them. So in this model, for example, I remove the precipitation, and it changed my model outcome and likelihood goodness of fit of that much. If I remove the second one, it changed my goodness of fit of that much. That tells me that removing precipitation has more impact than removing the drinkable water. So I'm going to rank precipitation first, drinkable water second. And then I'm going to have the Z fraction. Oh, that's a bit, you know. And then you have some very small negligible interaction in there, what you could expect. So here what you have is pretty much, yeah, water. That's, uh, that, that was the main issue at the time. It was a water problem. So once I, do, I did that, I was pretty happy about myself. You know, just, yeah, I have a win. Let's have a look at this, what's going to happen on the 70% now. And you have the 70% looking at the timing of extinction, and I got nothing, literally nothing. The model return, absolutely nothing. Not even a rank, everything was non significant. So the all, the, the all option that I had was to get very, very depressed, go to the pub, and just never look at this ever again. <laughs> or maybe take a step back and think, what did I miss? I did both. I went to the pub. I just tried to, you know, dwell for about an hour or two. I said, no, oh, yeah, so I was so sure that human have an impact. Nothing, nothing comes out. And then you come back and say, actually, the thing that I did here is I compare grid cell by grid cell. Each grid cell is each chronology. I assume that those grid cells are independent, that the grid cell here has no action whatsoever with the grid cell that is next to me. That's not true. That's the landscape. Species move. Things happen spatially explicitly. I need to have some sort of spatial component in the model so I can look at, instead of looking at the timing itself, how the timing happened, where the climate changed, where you, how human moved through the system, what's the pattern of the megafauna extension spatially explicitly. And so I included a new dimension in the model, which was gradients. So pretty much those nice arrows saying, okay, your megafauna extinction that come first here toward this way. To, so yeah, there is a direction this time. There is a connection between the landscape. And when I do exactly the same thing on this pattern, then I start having something. I start to have something happen much better, actually. And so when you look at the pattern of extinction itself, you have human having an impact, precipitation, drinkable water, and the ecosystem changes, so landscape, forest, non-forest, which pretty much ties back up to what we have been talking about since the first minute of this talk. There's nothing new. The ecological process are the same. When I remove human in the, in the, from the system, we have a little bit of a change. Precipitation, a bit less. So in that case, human was a little bit, import, was a little bit more important. Drinkable water comes second in that case. And the landscape is tied up to the rest, but not as uh, uh, important. So then you can go with a bunch of different assumptions. That could be, yeah, human might have followed water source. That's why I presented with the superhighways. If megafauna needs water as well, chances are that you're gonna have an encounter at some point. If I wanna hunt or if I want to do anything with megafauna, that's probably what, what, where things gonna happen, close to water source. I, we haven't been able to test that yet. That's still an hypothesis, but we probably come to some sort of competition for resources that make a good hunting playground. So to summarize that, we have some additive effects, not interaction, just an additive one. We have human climate on the regional pattern. The, the importance of the climate change and mostly a complex climate change, not only just our rainfall drop or temperature increase, we're talking also about uh, drinkable water and all of those ecosystem modeling that are the water cycle in there, the drinkable water that I explained, they just, it's complex system. It's just, can you use the water to survive? And then, like I said, dominant factor for climate change. So if I come back to my first slide, for the people who didn't want to uh, endure the, the one hour long talk, we have just an in, a different insight of one of the greatest achievements of humanity, to be honest. We're talking about things happening 50, 70,000 years ago. And that would be challenging with the technology that we have now. You know, so that's the, I, I thought that was pretty cool to 
do those things and to see how human managed to thrive through one of the worst world drives in every continent. Then you have migration pattern, like I said, environmental really important. Non-random, that was planned back in the day. There is there is a there is, there's a plan. Whichever it is, there was a plan. Number of people again and regional consequences of uh, human climate change on the government extension. And I'm gonna leave you with that. Thank you very much. Ooh.